Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 91. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today, returning. We are just talking about this. I believe the first guest return on in the, in, the, in the podcast history, other than like the people I started the podcast with. Uh, anyways, Jason Perez, thanks for coming back. Yo, my peoples, what's up? I'm from the Shell Stories YouTube channel. Uh, I used to be from the Every Night is Game Night podcast, so I, I technically I'm representing two different streams, so maybe it's not the same thing, but whatever. <laughs> You're the same person. I checked. The, I am the same person. You were in episode 25. Uh, we talked about mental health. Right, one of right, my favorite right, yes. episodes. I love I loved yeah. that one. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was like three and a half years ago. Yeah. So oh, my long. God. Yeah, You're right. <laughs> Yeah. Which is, which I, is okay. insane to think about. And then you were a guest on my pod with Paul Grogan talking about thematic games. That's right. I remember yep. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every once in a while, man. Every once once a year, like, we'll just share in the, the intellectual like thoughtfulness. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, no, no. I, I love these. Uh, we have elevated conversations every time. So it's like you posted something and it was a, a topic that I'm near and dear to my heart. So I'm like, I have to jump on this. I always love talking to Mark. Yeah, so the topic we're going to go over is colonialism, uh, which is kind of, in terms of theme-centered topics, has kind of been the big deal the last few years in board Absolutely. gaming uh, mm-hmm. for a number of reasons. And it's always something I've been interested in discussing and going on, but I don't really have the, I have a lot of disjointed thoughts. Uh, sure. and, I, and I never felt like I had uh, enough to like actually speak about it uh Mm -hmm. so that's why you're here jason because jason (laughs) uh has been studying this and talking about it for quite a bit with your your show shelf stories right 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 um so i mean i am is that the primary thing you do right now with board gaming i mean well it's it's a couple of streams like uh, self stories is my editorial channel so i actually do a bunch of stuff like i do podcast i do just playthroughs like just play straight up film a game for the one-stop co-op shop so I generally once a week, you know, I'll put something on the table light, light. I don't like to do heavy games. Like, so I just kind of churn through them. Uh, I am a review on the dice tower, which is fa- fascinating. Cause like, I don't totally talk about that a lot. Uh, I'm just kind of like, okay, I, I put the, I do videos there every once in a while. Like I love those guys and I love what they do. Uh, it's just like, you know, I have so much stuff going on. So this is the gaming stuff. So like, if like shelf stories doesn't have gaming on it. So it's like, how are you a gaming channel? You don't have any gaming on it. It's for everybody else. Uh, and so then shelf stories is my editorial channel. It's like, it's where I give discourses and it's kind of coalesced. Uh, so it used to be just like, you know, anything that I was, you know, thought about, it's like I did book chats and history, you know, I'm still interested in all that stuff, but it just, the momentum for the cultural stuff, my good trouble series. So good trouble is my cultural commentary. So it's like colonialism, slavery, uh, gender stuff, all the, all the hot, <laughs> all, the, all the fuego stuff. And I still do mother health. So like I have a shelf help series. So that's where, that's where that is. Uh, so when I talked about depression with you and I talk about, I have a video on imposter syndrome that I'm really proud of uh, a couple others. I, that one just hasn't gotten as much. And I really do want to kick that up again because it's just a perennial topic. I mean, people are always doing mental healthy something. So, you know, I will at some point, you know, get back into the mental health, but like, I think the, the good trouble stuff, the culture stuff, it's just, it just keeps on coming up. Like, there's so many games, so much to, it, we can get into it, but like it, it, the reason, like you mentioned before, why like that colonialism in particular, there's so many and they keep on happening and it's on a regular basis, just like drip, drip, drip of like, okay, this mistake, that mistake, this, the, p- these people are pissed off that. And it just, you know, it, it feeds right into the social media, like appetite for like just consistent engagement so it's like you know a week here a week here a week here this person says this this person says this it's almost like made for social media to blow up about it yeah which is interesting because it's certainly something worth talking about but at the same time i always feel weird uh, about it because i don't want to play into that cycle of like yeah you know, the things that are the most extreme get the most notice. For instance, like a couple years ago, I I, I would always get involved in the discussions whenever like journalistic integrity or uh, paid reviews of interest. Yeah. Paid reviews. That's the words I'm thinking. Paid reviews. That's the one you want. 
when that topic always came up, I always jumped in, gave my two cents. And after a while, I'm like, nothing's really, I, I'm not contributing anything new. Like someone's already said this. Uh, so right. I switched and every, now every time it comes up, I just, I support someone new on Patreon. And I'm oh. like, <laughs> so there you I'm go. Like, hey, it's, it's, it's that time <laughs> of the year. Right. This is the topic now. Uh, I'm going to support someone on Patreon instead of jumping into this, this mad debate. And I, I encourage other people mm-hmm. to do the same, but at the same time, like certain things are important. You do want to talk about them in a productive way, not a way sure. that just kind of feeds that, that anger cycle. Um, mm-hmm. and it seems like, I don't know, maybe, it, maybe it's, Maybe maybe I'm personally biased because it's what I do, but like these kind of long form videos, podcasts, written pieces mm-hmm. seem to be the most productive way to do it, right? We yeah, no you sit down and you, and you actually think through something rather than just mm-hmm. kind of spouting out a tweet. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I so I have my I, at this point I think I have somewhere around fifty good trouble videos. It's a lot, and I the way I do it is I'll do a a piece and like when my first big good trouble piece was on Puerto Rico. I'm Puerto Rican. I, you know, this is it just folds in. I've been thinking about this for years and years. And so that was my big piece, colonialism and slavery. Uh, and then what ended up happening was there was so much discussion, like the YouTube comments just blew up and it was great. Uh, and I've gotten a lot better at like kind of crafting a good YouTube comment section. Like it's really hard. Like you have to be willing to delete stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's the thing. It's like, oh, do you want to delete people's stuff? It's like, yeah, of course I want to delete people's oh, stuff. If people just gonna <laughs> you know? yeah but you never know like you know it's like okay well you're you're banning people or you're like silencing it's like no no no. moderation and banning are two very different things and just kind of like getting better at it and it's like okay so i put the video out and then I put a follow-up out following up on the discussion so it's like okay you know have the discussion and then process my thoughts and put a follow-up out and like i'm getting like designers and publishers like this isn't just like you know flavor of the week stuff anymore like people are like like mucky mucks are like asking me for my opinion and uh, i guess i can announce well not announce but like because i've I've soft launched it but i've actually uh formed my own cultural consulting business so publishers are actually paying me money to consult in their games and make sure that that it you know just is culturally sensitive and doesn't have any kind of unconscious biases and it's been really great because people will send me their stuff and i'm like good thing you sent me that <laughs> Woo-hoo, okay and they're like oh thank you so much you know it saves them money in the long run i mean people think like oh it's like such a grift you know uh, that's the big thing about culture because all oh, well, you, you know you're just giving it to them and they're you know they're telling you what to do and they, whatever it's like no 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 like like this is real. Like people have these sensitivities and people have honest concerns. It isn't just like a bunch of blow up. People have honest concerns. People are really bothered and hurt. And like, wow, I was looking forward to this. And this this other thing happened in the game and made me bum me out. And it's like, why walk into that? Just, you know, get a guy, get a person who has just a fresh set of eyes. And I'm now that person, you know, or like there's a couple of us out there. Now I'm getting to know a few of them and just, you know, head it off at the pass. And, you know, and I, I've had at this point, um, I don't think I, I don't think any of the games I've worked on have come out yet. So like I'm under NDA for a lot of them, but I, you will see the difference, mm-hmm. you know, some of these games are going to come out and it's going to, and people are going to have fun. They're going to be rad. Yeah. You know, not because and I didn't contribute and I didn't write a word. It's just editing. It's like, okay, shave off some of the rough edges and enjoy your game. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So like things are really happening. Like that's the point, like you were saying before, like you don't want to feed the anger cycle. Me neither. You know, I want to be constructive and like, this is, there's some real change going on. So I'm really excited about this cultural stuff, which is weird to say. It's like, oh my God, you're excited about trouble. It's like, yeah, (laughs) as a matter of fact, yeah, we're talking about real issues. I'm I'm a human. I love humans. So the the humans talking about human stuff is just, I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's not weird to me. I mean, maybe that, I mean, that comes across, that kind of excitement comes across as as odd to some people, but I mean, Mm -hmm. that's super exciting. And well, let let let's take a step back, mm-hmm. right? Sure, sure, sure. Let's 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 start with some kind of base here to the conversation and, and retreat back to just the idea of colonialism in, in board games. And I guess it it mostly goes back to Puerto Rico, right? Right. In that was the of first like the big first one, big yes. game right. that mm-hmm. hits a lot of the 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 traps that you see all the time, or, mm-hmm. or falls into those traps. 
Because there were games. I mean, yeah. the, the Germans have made games about play. Like, you know, Settlers of Catan is technically a colonialism game. It just didn't put it. It's just Catan. It's fictional, so it doesn't touch those. Doesn't scratch those itches. Right, right. You know. So like the uh, and they've they've always been in Germany. Like I, I'm, the names are escaping me because they're in German. Uh, like you know, if that culture had like they they've wanted to build in their gaming for a very very long time, and they'll and I'll take from historical like that that's something that's kind of deeply ingrained in that culture ever since I guess World War II from from some of the research that I'm doing like you know they they wanted to build they wanted to just move on from that entire history and move on from the entire basically the entire 20th century to that point because it's two been two world wars and you know two losses and everything like no we want to build. And we want to enjoy like pastoral scenes and, uh, you know, all this, all the trappings that we know of the Agricolas and the, all, all these games. And so like they had a, you know, it just kind of like, you know, they went the fiction route for some of them. And then some of the other ones, they just kind of went into historical time periods, you know, and that is, I mean, we can get into this now, but like the, the idea that like the world exists as this like IP or like buckets of IP that I can just like yank from and like, you know, to get you know basically attention because people have heard of these places. And, you know, it's so, and so that, so that's been, that was like kind of brewing in Germany and in that European context for a very, very long time. And Puerto Rico was the first one that I think really hit just in a, a broader kind of international gaming context. Yeah. And in, in what are the, like the specific issues there like what specifically like you say okay sure. it, it's colonialist what is what does that mean in, right. in specifically okay. i guess using puerto rico as like the example uh, it, it is a it, puerto rico does most of the things that <laughs> that cause a problem so okay so like and it's a very thank you for asking that question people don't really a lot of people that's why i come on a thoughtful gamer this is a very thoughtful question <laughs> uh, <laughs> because people say it's like, okay well we can't have bad things in games what you know this is bad that's bad it's like that's so general i can't do anything with that like you have to drill down and, and really understand what's going on okay so for a colonialist game is so every game has a perspective. Every game tells a story. Every single game, like unless you're playing Go, I mean, you're playing even then, you know, like because like, those are usually it's martial. Vague, so you're like playing a warlord. Yeah, you're playing a warlord. Like checkers, yeah. you're playing a warlord. Yeah. Chess, you're playing war. So like every single game, so even the abstract, but you come from a perspective. And so what? So just right there, you have to start from what the perspective is of your of your game. So the Puerto Rico game starts from the perspective of the colonizer. You are a colonizer, like and just right in the rule book, you know, it it the this it puts you in 1492, Columbus saw the ocean blue. It's right there in the new world, right? Maritime and you know, the time period and the the balloons and all the everything. So, like you are your perspective is the colonizer. So that's number one. Like I, I like to call these games a kind of boss fantasies. So like it doesn't just put you in the in the in the seat of like the time period. It puts you in the seat of a particular person in the time period, which is the boss. You know, you're the merchant, and you are gathering the money. You're the you're, it's not capitalism yet, but like you're the mercantilist, right? And you are the person that is is causing money. So that's that's the first thing. Bosses in that time period own slaves. It's how you generate wealth. I mean, they, 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 you know, and that's one of those things where it's like you know, oh well, now you're going to do this. No, no. This is historical fact, people. Like they, they, you did not, especially in the age of exploration, especially in, this, in Atlantic. If you're making money in the transatlantic system, you own slaves. That's just what you did, you know. And like maybe there was like you know the, the occasional abolitionist who, because you know you always had abolitionists. Slavery has always been thought of as wrong. It just was that was a fringe idea. Like the the, that, the main thing was like you own slaves. So then, okay, so you're, you're this colonialist person and you're building wealth off of the backs of slaves. So then what Puerto Rico does, which is completely outrageous, is controversial. We could talk about that. But like for me, for what's completely outrageous is not only are you, are you the boss, not only is it painting the colonialist picture uh, of, you know, a 15th century Puerto Rico, not just like general, but like it's right there. You see the workers, you, the workers come in on the ship. And you put the workers on the field, on the plantation, like the workers are planting corn and they're in the cities and they're so inert. Like it, it's basically like I I'll call it a boss fantasy. Like what is the most fantastical thing a boss could have? Free labor <laughs> that doesn't need to be fed, that doesn't die, that doesn't ain't, that doesn't go on strike, that doesn't do anything. It just I, I tell the workers what to do and they do it. 
that was the that and that's the that's the ideal worker and that you know that's what slaves were you know unless they were rebelling unless they were dying unless they were you know doing all these things but you they've they they taken all that out right and now you're just a worker so then okay so that's all that's that's the game is doing all that if the game called them slaves then okay we're now we're having some kind of like you know reflection Right. It's like, okay, am I really doing this? This so then this is the and this is the last mile. This is almost like the, the thing that seals the deal in terms of what Puerto Rico and similar games, not just Puerto Rico, but similar games do wrong, is that they lie. They call the workers colonists. They were not colonists. They were slaves. Colonists not come to the real world to like, oh, yeah, that's the immigrant fantasy, right? Like I came over and I'm going to make them make my wealth and I'm going to be a worker. I'm going to be a, 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 a whatever. Um, I'm going to build my wealth one day and I'm going to be the, the capitalist just like them. Uh, and I'm going to own wealth. But no, that, no. Well, first of all, like the Puerto Rico didn't even have a, like the, the, the history is just ridiculous. Like it, it, Puerto Rico didn't have like coffee and sugar. Like they didn't even have it in the 15th century. They didn't come until the 19th century or the 18th and 19th century. Like, that's all later. So it's like an anachronism anyway. And, you know, Andrea C. Fair, uh, designer and the publishers, you know, Aaliyah slash um, Ravensburger in partnership with Rio Grande. Uh, so uh, they've always, ha- Aaliyah Ravensburger has always had the game and Rio Grande brought it to America. So then, like, they've always kind of not really cared. It was just kind of like, spin the globe, this is cool. And they never wanted to, they never wanted to tell the story. And they kind of like got general things right but like you look into it, it's like there's so many historical inaccuracies and well, whatever, who cares? The point is like the biggest historical inaccuracy is the calling them colonists. They were slaves. And they call them colonists in order to make people feel better about playing. Because aside from the perspective, there's the audience. The audience is not like a war game audience. A war game audience or a Twilight Struggle. I know you're, that's one of your favorite games, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So well, who's the audience for Twilight Struggle? Like it, it's a person who knows the Cold War or it's a person who's, who's aware of the history and all that. that's the audience for that. Like, no, that, that's not the audience for Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not going for a special audience. They're going for mass market. They're going for families. They're going for, so they want the people who play Puerto Rico to feel good. Mm-hmm. So, they, so they have to lie in order to, in order for their game to be what, it, what they want it to be. Mm-hmm. So you, so you, you are, Per, put in perspective of the colonizer, which is a morally thing, morally whatever to begin with, you're using slaves, you're operating slaves, and the slaves are completely devoid of all agency, and, and their whole history is erased except for the fact that they do labor. That's that's bad, and then they lie and call them colonists just to make the player feel better about playing. Mm-hmm. So that's that's as much as I can. I, I mean, I'm sure we can go into the details of it, but I think that's about the sweep of what to get, what it gets wrong. Yeah, and, and and that's that's an incredibly persuasive argument because there's a lot I've I, I, there's a lot of seen in red in regards to colonialism in I can't say that word colonialism in board games. Uh, that's good, but I also see a whole lot that basically tries to make the argument either implicitly that. It should never be a topic of board gaming. Right. And personally, well, I have two perspectives there. One is that I I don't have a whole lot of historical knowledge, but I am interested in moral philosophy. And that's kind of one of my like intellectual hobbies. So that's the argument of like what is right and wrong in regards to board gaming theming and and, uh, expression is really interesting to me. But Mm -hmm. also I'm I. Personally, I am really compelled by the idea of board games in which you are the villain. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that I think Twilight Struggle, you know, since you referenced that, does brilliantly, right? One of the things that's so good about that game, so fascinating, is that w- when the player is in the agency of these like mega world leaders of, of either mm-hmm. the Soviet Union or the US, the perspective is so broad that massive events are just like an everyday thing. Like they're, they're a right. single action, right? The entire right. Cuban Viet- missile crisis is like one card. The entire <laughs> Vietnam war is a card. It's right. just one card of a hundred and something cards in the game, the entire Vietnam war. Right. And it communicates that like, there's something really wrong about giving people the amount of power 
where mm-hmm. the Vietnam War is a pawn in their game. So, I mean, that's so powerful. That's one of the most powerful things I've experienced in a board game. And and so I think board games have almost uniquely that capability of showing the corruptive nature of power. Because sure. all the players in a game, in almost any game, are going to be powerful or else you don't really have agency in the game. Like that's that goes hand in hand. And so, right, if you give the players that power... Like you can do really cool, important things with it. And so I don't really, I don't buy the idea that you can't play or that you should not make a game in which the players play as, for instance, slave owners. Mm -hmm. But I think your argument against Puerto Rico is incredibly convincing because it does that incredibly poorly, (laughs) right? It it, does it it it, Mm -hmm. without compassion. It does it historically inaccurately it does it without perspective of the seriousness of the of the setting right right well it's making a happy fun times game so like yeah. I, I call it um i'm developing this argument and i'm going to do like a presentation soon on some his, historical gaming panel so i'm still kind of forming this so forgive me if i'm it's this is an incomplete idea but i'm i'm forming the idea of like euro games like puerto rico and there's many more we can get into that uh as historical tourism games they're not history. So Twilight Struggle is more evocative of history. And I find war games are more evocative, just in general, of more evocative history, history games. Mm-hmm. So the games want to teach you history. Right? And, they, and there's like other exceptions. I just did a playthrough for um, Days of Ire, Budapest 1956, which is a fantastic game. I love it so much. It's a history game. It teaches real ass history. And but that's not what these Euro games do. That's not what Maracaibo does. It's not what uh, Quest for El Dorado does. It's not what, ugh, God, there's so many of them, like Amun Ray and these, these games that kind of appropriate from different lands, different cultures, you know, or like Puerto Rico that actually has a, a date on it or like an era on a new world. They're not teaching history. They're just like, they're giving you the version of like, um, you know, the Hall of Presidents at Epcot Center. <laughs> you, know, the, you know the, the jaw jack and mark twain robot in you know the simpsons that's the history it's giving you because it's audience and the audience is so big that, you know it's that the audience is a mass market and it wants to give that historical immersion or like just a, the flavor of a more historical immersion give you take you know grab your attention that much oh i've heard of puerto rico i've heard of these, these things grab the, the gamer's attention that much with a real world setting and put you in that boss mode of like a merchant or whatever but with no reflection whatsoever none give you that tourist resort Everything is wonderful. All the natives are smiling and they're, they're giving you fruit and they're serving your every need. Here's some corn. I don't even have to use a, a production to actually have corn and you generating all this money. So like, again, yes, I totally want to, and that's why I thank you for, you know, framing this question, this discussion. I'm not going to sit here and say colonization games are bad. There's plenty of colonization games that I'll play and they're good and whatever it is. Uh, not that they're good, but like they, 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 they do the right things. They make you think. And they make you learn and they make you curious and they can, can make you grapple. This game does none of these things. It's they're just there to have fun. And I've spoken with the publishers, you know, I I'm make no bones about that, about this, you know, because I did a couple of videos and they reached out to me. You know, like you said, you know, they appreciated the long form, they appreciated the dialogue. And like they would change the name in a heartbeat. They don't care, but the gamers care. It's branded. So they're stuck. I figure what to do. So that's what that's what, like, you know, and, and dot, 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 you know, um, I, I, I'm not at liberty to say a whole lot um, there. They have announced a new version of Puerto Rico, but there's a dot, dot, dot on that one. So I'm just going to mi- mix on that. But I do want to say that, like, if they could press the eject button on this and just make it about anything else, they would. They can't because of the branding. So that tells me they're making not making a serious argument about Puerto Rico. <laughs> if they would jump right. ship like a yeah, section. Yeah. <laughs> So I get so frustrated because you hear these online conversations like, oh, well, you're banning history and you do. No, you're not. You're not banning anything. This, you're banning the, the jaw Jack and Mark Twain robot at Epcot Center. That's what you're banning. Get out of here. Like, who's going to miss that? <laughs> well, you're also not banning it. Like you're making an argument that it should not be. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm criticizing. Criticism is not cancellation. Banning in, it, it implies some right. amount of force. Right. Yes. 
Uh, it is a persuade, and we could talk about cancel culture too, or whatever. Like, you know, that is like you know, per- persuasion is not coercion. Criticism is not cancellation. I am making a persuasive argument. Yes, I believe that Puerto Rico, as it currently exists, should not be right, and that is a bad idea to make it. But I affirm the right of the makers to make it if they if they, if they decided if they only decided because it's about to hit the twenty first twentieth anniversary. Two thousand one was the original publication date. Uh, Two thousand two, sorry. Uh, so then twenty twenty two is coming up. Twentieth anniversary is coming up. Uh, they could, if they decide, if they wanted to, just here have the same Puerto Rico, and they, I would, I, they have the right to do it. I have the right to criticize, and it's so that it's this is an act of persuasion here, and my videos have been an act of persuasion, and all these colonialist games, these are acts of persuasion. I don't want them to exist because that perspective of the colonizer and the audience that is the mass market that forces lies. And we can go over other games that lie. I got plenty of others that <laughs> lie their faces off. That have to lie. Endeavor, Age of Sail, lies <laughs> about slavery. <laughs> I'm sorry. Have you played Endeavor or no? I, I remember reading something about that. Aren't there like multiple editions? And there's a multiple editions, yes. And w- like one of them addresses it head on, and another one just kind of sidesteps it or something. I, I vaguely the, the remember first reading edi- something. I, I mean, I haven't played, I haven't played the previous editions. I, I played the, the latest edition, and I know they're going to reiterate again. Because <laughs> they, because I the the publishers really believe in the mechanism, they want to kind of save it. I I, I doubt that it'll ever happen, but whatever. And so the the current iteration, basically, and you're you're a moral guy, so it turns slavery in kind of a moral choice, in the sense of like you can participate in slavery, but it's and you get all this extra stuff, but you also like either get negative points or you risk like another faction like progressing the time period to abolition and like your empire is ruined or whatever it is so you're playing this like it, it, you're gamifying it it's like okay am I, i'm gonna do this and it's like this risk reward thing and it's like okay you can do that in your game but that is still not a history game that's not how slavery worked on history it was just a thing that you did it was a wealth generating thing I mean, and, like maybe that maps if you're like right on the cusp of abolition, right? And you, and as a, as an uh, right. uh, uh, an amoral entrepreneur, you're you know weighing whether or not the abolition abolition movement's going to gain steam or not. Like, but yeah, no, no, no that yeah, yeah. So it's it's again, it's also it's and that's the reason why like they just kept on trying to they're, they're still trying to come up with something that will like well, be eat, honor the history but also be pleasing to gamers. And I just don't think, personally, I don't think that is ever going to work. I really don't. No, and that falls into the a, a trap that that I think all games have an incredibly hard time with with regards to morality. Is mm-hmm. that the most plain, obvious, and perhaps only communication method of moral right and wrong in games is utilitarian. Mm-hmm. Everything else relies a lot on like extra game emotions, right? right? And so you see the moral, emotional, like non-utilitarian approach work on occasion, right? That's like why Papers, Please was such a a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, I like that one. Because it didn't distill all moral arguments into, well, one of them gives you a better outcome. Right. But that's so hard to do in games because games are about inputs and outputs and the outputs are like Mm -hmm. rewards, right? And if you just had it where the morally right option gave you rewards and the morally bad option always punished you, then you just cut out the morally bad option because like no one would ever choose that, right? It becomes vestigial. And so it's incredibly hard to make moral arguments in game form. So many of them do the risk reward thing. Yeah. Like you could do it. But and you can get all this extra stuff so that you incentivize to do it, but you risk, you know, uh, a, a, a event card coming or event risk, you know, another player revealing your whatever, whatever. And I don't know that, you know, speaking on the moral level, that that the board games are a great engine at all. I really don't. I think I think if maybe that's why I, I'm I'm really compelled by the games that where you're playing the villain, right? You're playing mm-hmm. someone bad. And it's because board games are really good at systems. They create systems right. of incentives. And so if you're doing a historical mm-hmm. game where the system, the incentive structure is such that you do bad things, that says yeah, something like a, about the system. 
like letters from Whitechapel. Are you playing like Jack that. the Ripper? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, well, it's a one verse mini, and the one is Jack the Ripper. So like you, you it puts you in a mindset of a Jack the Ripper where you're like plotting how to avoid the the, the inspectors and kill as many people as possible, or, or whatever. However that plays out, I don't know if it's like a, a quantity thing, but like yeah, but like you have specific targets that you're going for. But yeah, like you know you can play the villain in that game, and but there's nothing moral about the game system. All the moral reflection, as you said, is kind of afterwards. Like how do I feel about that exercise of power? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you but can do the that. games that do yeah. the systems really well, I'm thinking of more like like John Company, mm-hmm. uh, which is about the East uh, East India Trading Company and, and the people yep. who operated that is a really good job of, of this kind of systems thinking. Mabel Holland, uh, I haven't, I, I've only played out once, but uh, with This Guilty Land, uh, mm-hmm. trying to examine the systems around the slavery in the United States and in the in the political structures. Uh, so I think games do a really good job at that. But but yeah, it's really hard to go beyond that. And I see it I see it more and more. Maybe I'm really peeved about this because I I just saw uh, the last duel in theaters the other day. I don't know if you, know you watched this. Nope. Do you care if I spoil not really spoil it? Go for okay. it. I, I I watched so few movies. Go for it. Yeah. So <laughs> so the last duel it's a it's a true story, you know, as much as as movies. I, I think it's relatively actually pretty fairly accurate to the to the broad strokes. And it's it's set in France in the fourteenth, thirteenth century. And it's about uh, this woman who gets raped by this former friend of of her husband. and they bring criminal charges and it ends up going to the duel and it ends up being the last state sanctioned duel by the French government. The idea being that whoever wins the duel was like that that outcome was ordained by God and it brings the truth out. Uh, mm. But the point is the, the movie's more about like her struggle to like exist in this system and whether or not right. she should say anything at all mm-hmm. and, and all those complexities. And at the very end. So I'll. I'll you said you didn't mind spoilers. So spoiler warning, uh, if you don't know the story, uh, her husband ends up winning, so they both get uh, vindicated by by the by the court system. And there's a shot at the very end where they're riding away on horseback because there's this huge crowd in in Paris for to watch this duel, and everyone's cheering and celebrating him. And they show her kind of in the background on horseback, and no one's really paying attention to her. And I thought for sure that would be the last shot of the movie. Mm. And then they fade out, and they fade in to her because uh, she was pregnant at the time in this like idyllic grassy field playing with her like two-year-old her toddler kid and then it goes to this like exit card about how you know how long she lived and she was wealthy and and, and, and etc and i'm like why did they have to include all that right like, isn't the right. whole thing about her actions as difficult as they were being right regardless mm-hmm. of the outcome or at least the potential of them being right right According to principle, you know, like they, there was a, there were principles. Regardless operative, yeah. of what happens, regardless of how long she ends up living or how wealthy she is, or if she gets to know her kid, like it, it the, the very end really got to me. And I think it's the same thing. Right. But in movies, you, you can end ambiguously. You can end on those notes. Like all they had to do was cut out the last 20 seconds of the movie. It, <laughs> it really got on my nerves, but it's, it's the thing in games, right? Where it, mm-hmm. you don't have those ambiguous moments or at least it's very difficult to create those in games you can only create like here's a reward for doing the right thing and then so then what do you do with the bad thing well you make it a push your luck mechanism i mean i don't blame them for like settling on that i can't think of a better alternative in game form if you wanted to have like a a moral conundrum like what do you do with that in a game i mean like okay, you mentioned this. Other than land, just right? presenting I mean, it as it is, and then you choose right. the bad path. That's and it what gives yeah, you rewards, right. and now you know you're the villain. Like now you know you've gone down a, a path mm-hmm. you cannot reverse from. That's like, what Gil- this the- land did, right? Like it, it was what it did. Like okay, here you are the slaver. You know you're a bastard. Now, this game is not going to let you off the hook. Yeah, you know, you and that—that's that's what. Yeah, that's the solution to it. Just let them let well, people did, do okay. it. 
games are technologies. Like you do whatever, you know, like anything within the, within the field, do it. It's just like, be aware of audience. Like so many of these conversations, they talk about the games, but they don't talk about the gamer. They don't talk about the audience. Like what kind of feeling do you want your game to evoke? And, you know, if you want your game to be popular, it has to follow certain rules. But if you want to just make a statement with your game and you just, you know, then then you can go for it. You can go gonzo. So then, you know, if you're going for a mass market and that's what that. So bring it back to like the, these Euro games. Right. So we have so many of these colonization Euro games like they don't want to make historical statements. They don't care. I've spoken. I've spoken with enough of these designers by now, and I've gotten to know a lot of the Euro designers. Blessed, you know, because I've, you know, a couple of them. In fact, there was, was one that called me in tears. What am I doing? What have I done for the last ten years? And watching one of my videos, like hearing me explain, um, it was a, it was a video that I taught connecting the dots and like arguing, like basically like themes like a magic trick. Like there's like it's it's cardboard, right? And it's 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 chits and stuff, and you, you're arranging the dots in a way to let people kind of make connections, right? So if like, if I put, you know, this uh, hay barrel here, like this hay colored thing here, and I put a green patch here, I've evoked farm, right? I, but I, you know, I, 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 there is no farm on the board. It says a green square and a, and a, and a, a, a red, yellow square. But like I, I, with my art, with my mechanisms, I have, led players to connect it as farm great like there's no farm in the game it's all in the player so then with these more complicated historical games the associations get a little bit looser and it depends on people's experience like the, the experience is the thing that fills the gap so it's like if it's puerto rico and it's for a german audience it doesn't know anything about puerto rico most of them haven't even heard of puerto ricans especially in 2002 I traveled the world like in the, two, in the 2000s and I would go to these places and no one ever heard of Puerto Rican. So they always thought I was like from the place. It's like, I look Palestinian. So I gotta be, you know, I grew out my beard to be Palestinian. I go to um, India. It's like, Oh, I look like I'm from North India because I'm a little bit lighter skin. Puerto Rican. What's that? <laughs> so they don't associate it with slavery. They, they don't care. It's just, a, it's, it's just, a, again, you get that whole thing. It's just a game because it is just a game to them. They, they you see the, the, the dots they recognize are mercantile and wealth and building money. And, and the thing is, I'm cool with that. Like, that's cool. Like you don't see the colonialism in there. I tell you it's in there, but like, you don't get it. I'm cool with that. Don't tell me what I see. Don't tell me how I connect the dots based on my experience. I, I, I don't have fun playing this game because the way, because all the dots that your game presents is interacting with my dots and my meaning making. And I'm coming up with something that you'd never come up with because you don't have my life experience. And the way that the designer connect, you know, the dots that were presented, the year, the perspective, and the way they connected the dots is just a big cause of a big problem. And the fact that they meant the game to be for everybody. So they introduced this lie to, to smooth it over. So I had to overcome this extra barrier of, wait a minute, they're lying to me, where it causes even more trouble. It's like, eh, it's colonists, don't worry about it. For like people who don't have the context, it's like, no, they, we shouldn't tolerate this stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, I mean, okay, I didn't know how I, I got I got quite on that <laughs> tangent. That's fine. But yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how'd uh, i go on a tangent that's how Mark? this you, you podcast goes it, it would not be the thoughtful <laughs> gamer podcast without, that's true, without that's true, that's a true. number of tangents <laughs> um i mean I, 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 I well we were talking about what um i don't the, know the, i got, like, I got well, up on that movie i watched the other day i started oh, yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> that's just, true. The tangents nest. It's it's a whole. Uh, oh yeah, it's a whole Russian situation. nesting doll. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So um, we were talking about the difference between like 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 what makes it, like how can you make these games like you yeah, basically you know like when is it bad when is it good when is it bad and to me it's like okay I hate that question it's up to but it's up to you know your intention it's up to the audience right you know and so if your audience is willing to play this guilty land if your if your audience is willing to you know do the, the hard moral choices and even a game like letters from white chapel like they don't like stint on like you being jack ripper being a kind of a bastard so like you know it, you, it's a moment of for reflection it is not a game that i would just love to distribute everywhere like be careful with it but you know they're the game is doing stuff intentionally these euro games are, are very like they they want to they want the good stuff from history but they don't want the bad they want to have their cake and eat it too they want the immersion from 
these historical time periods and they want to make people happy, but they don't want people to associate this with the bad stuff. So they do all these things, right, to wash it away. But the problem is that the dots thing, there are some of us for whom we won't, we will resist the wash. The wash won't work. The, whether it's the white wash, whether it's the green wash, if you're talking about uh, Australia, which we talk about, uh, uh, that's a different one. Uh, I don't want to go too far down the tangent, but like there are some people for whom that, you know, you put your historical game out and the washing is fine because they don't have the context, but I do. What the washing that your games do won't erase what I see and what, I, what I've experienced, especially again, Puerto Rico. It's named after my freaking island, for God's sakes. And not to say that all Puerto Ricans see it. There's I know plenty of Puerto Ricans like, oh yeah, yeah, I love Puerto Rico. I replaced the little wood chips with meatballs <laughs> and I play Puerto Rico because they for whatever reason they don't have the historical memory and they just happen to have a game, you know, like one game. So it's like they they are able to kind of do the cognitive dissonance thing and they just don't really, you know, engage with the historical aspect of it. But I'm Puerto Rican and I'm historically minded. I'm a, I'm a student in history. I'm halfway to a master's in history, 15 years going, but I'll get to that eventually. <laughs> I can't unsee it. So I'm not, I'm not saying that if you, and this is a big thing that um, people think like, I've, I'm like, if you play Puerto Rico, you're bad or you're racist or whatever. I'm not going to say that you don't have the, the context for it, but don't take away that I have my context. And if I want to try to put out there, like, okay, maybe we can kind of, you know, change things so that everybody's happy. Oh, cancel culture. Da, 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 da. No, no, no. No, let, let's try at least. And it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least try. Because this is my experience. And I, I do not want to be bummed out playing the one game that is about my island. Mm -hmm. Now I got like three paths I want to go down. Let's start, <laughs> let's start quickly. So you say, you know, and I think this is an incredibly important point, especially when in the context of, of social media and how public discourse is. And you say, you know, you, you, if you like Puerto Rico, I don't think you're racist. But I, I you know, right. I've seen a number of people who would, who have made or would make that claim, right? If, right? if you enjoy this game, I do think you're racist. How do I phrase this question? On that particular topic, and maybe a few other uh, things, you know, the hot button issues, our language is like too small, where I feel like. If someone is saying, if you enjoy Puerto Rico, you're racist, is it more accurate for them to say, if you enjoy Puerto Rico, you're ignorant of these specific things about the game? Is that like the more specific thing? And then it all gets lumped under the idea of you are a racist. Again, in the way people talk about these really personal, morally important issues, it seems like there is a lot of finger pointing of and judging of like, if you do this, you are a bad person. The end right. when someone, you know, someone who's not engaged on Twitter for two hours a day, maybe has mm -hmm. no clue what they're talking about. And I think it kills so much of our conversation as gamers, as people, et cetera, that, that the words we're using are not precise to convey what we mean, especially oh, on the, mm -hmm. to, like to me, the more important and serious the topic is, the more precise the language should be. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, I, I, I literally do this every video, especially with control video. I separate the practice from the person. I always separate. I, I go backwards. It's like, okay, I'm not calling anybody. In fact, that was my very first kind of like big video, so to speak. It was about uh, after the Danielle Tassini thing where he, you know, said it unfortunate. Uh, and he said the N word in, in Italian and then someone leaked it out and people were calling him a racist and white supremacist and everything. And, and I, I, in my video, I, I, yeah, and this is, I didn't even think I, like, this is just something I always do. And most people always do. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, many, many of my side do that. So like I said, okay, I don't, I don't know if Tassini is a racist. I am not going to say a word about that. I'm going to talk about the thing that was said and that thing is racist. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, using, I'm using that word very specifically. I could, I could mealy mouth it and be like, oh, great, that was an unfortunate thing to say. No, 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 it's racist. Oh, yeah. The thing, not the person. Yeah. The thing, not the person. So that, that, and that, that has been a feature of my videos all the time. Excellent. So then, all the time. So then, what happens is many of us on the progressive side make that distinction because we have to live with white people 
I'm talking to a white person. I'm on the one-stop co-op shop. There's feed me and five white people. And, and, you know, like the, the gaming hobby, like 92.6% of the uh, top five, 500 BGD uh, game designers are white people. And I'm, I go to these game stores. I'm surrounded by white. What am I going to do? I'm going to sit there and just call all y'all racist? No. Like we've learned to, many of us, I'll say, have learned to separate that. It's like, okay, that thing is racist. And then people will say, like, actually, that it happens on the receiver end. The receiver will often say, oh, that thing, you're calling that thing racist. Am I racist for playing it? Am I racist for liking it? So it becomes more of a receiver thing. That's number one. Um, that, that interpretation, like, you know, there's like a, a, set, a step that's not made in the speech, but it's made in the interpretation and how it's received. That's number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, the way social media is, you know, I, if I say this thing is racist, I do a carefully, you know, worded argument. I'll get, you know, what, 10 likes, yeah, some subs. Right? It's- and then if I say he's racist, that's going to get a billion. So it's like, it feels like there's a whole group of people, like that all of us are calling people racist. No, it's just the person that just laid out the, that used the accusation. They're just getting the one, they're the one getting picked up the attention. Yeah. It's like, there's a, a whole, there's a like whole a bunch of, of us that are. It's like a form of like a survivorship bias, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of us who make those distinctions, and we're very careful about our language. You know, we you know we code switch and we self moderate, and like we're very like there's you'll find a lot of us in the progressive side are very very reflective about this stuff, and we don't want to just cause trouble where where it's unfruitful because we know what that is. We know what it means to be shunned and bullied and all stuff. We don't want that. So then many of us are practiced. I did a whole episode with Sen Fu Lim, the designer, about this very subject of self-moderation and, and careful selection of words and how a lot of marginalized people, POCs, are like really good at it because we have to be. Mm-hmm. Because we go into these spaces and we, we don't speak, you know, or we, we're not careful with our words, we're going to get the hammer. That's just the way it is for us. And so, like, most of us, I would say, that I've met, are careful, but then the people that are not careful, the people that are speaking from he and hurt and whatever it is, those voices get amplified. And that's where our discourse kind of goes off the rails like you were describing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's the thing I'm trying to become more o- aware of with myself is recognizing that I probably am seeing, in some cases, like the extreme of everything. And also understanding, yeah, not letting that affect you, right? Like not letting that, un, like being constantly aware that you are, like you, what you are taking in is selected by the algorithms and just the masses who enjoy conflict. It's not a perfect public at, at a, open at a square. It, it is disproportionate so, rate, like right. an extremely disproportionate rate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can't it, tell you how many conversations I've gone into about cancel culture where it's like, okay, look at all the big Twitter mob and, you know, that are, that are calling for their head. Like, you look at these threads, look at how people are talking about. For the most part, when you see, like, you know, like the Tassini thing is a perfect example, go ahead and look at the Reddit threads that were on the Tassini thing. Most of them, most of the comments who are critical were along the lines of, I am personally hurt by what he said. Mm-hmm. I want, I don't think I'm comfortable playing with the, his game anymore. Sure. Like, that's most of them. You know, and yeah. and so it's like they, that's not a mob. That's the opposite of a mob. Those are the people that are being reflective, and the people that are just like kind of reflecting their personal hurt. And you're gonna see a couple of voices, of course. I'm not gonna deny that they exist or anything that they're like calling for. You know, they be canceled, whatever it is. Like, but that's like a mob is like a, a, a wide movement of that. It's way overblown. Yeah, I think. And and even as you say that, I'm thinking back to my recollection of that controversy. And now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, there were a lot of people making, obviously there's always the, you know, there's always great people making good arguments, but like, you know, if I were to go back and count, right, probably the vast majority were making fine arguments. And Mm -hmm. however, if you'd asked me five minutes ago, my recollection of that controversy, one of the the quick one is one of the main things that would have stood out is that. There's probably a large number of people who would think that people who choose to play his game still are racist, right. but there was probably like two people total who made right. that argument, right? It's and just, I want to, and this is a really, this is a really like rough point that I'm making, right? And it's the point I made earlier. I want to circle back to it. Yeah, yeah. That like this accusation of they're calling me racist 
is a creation of the receiver and the way they're interpreting it more than what is said uh, very often. So like, you know, I will, I always, you know, uh, I mean, and this is something I encounter pretty much every video at this point. Well, somebody will say, so I'll say like I, my, my most recent ones were on culture appropriation uh, in Marrakesh. It was like the game on the Stefan Feld uh game that was recently on kickstarter and oh, you know an he, awful he, an awful uh marketing picture yeah yeah exactly right i did a couple videos on this so it's like you know, he's you know stefan feld is in like the, the jalaba and the fez like traditional moroccan garb and you know he looks like a trade a trader like you know pulling a camel into the desert or whatever it is uh it's just, it was just like to me it was in poor taste and i did my i, I sent my videos and so it's like i got feedback including this one on twitter that i'll never i won't forget this it's like okay you're attacking him you're you're calling him, you know, or you know, how could you attack him? And it's like, when did I attack him? It's like, well, you're using the word and the, you know, appropriation. So you're accusing him of doing this terrible thing. It's like, no, I'm articulating about the practice, and that that interpretive step was taken by someone who loves their thing. So it's like when you attack a thing that somebody loves, they're gonna feel attacked. So, like, you know, I think that so much of our, our discourse goes wrong because I like I want to be able to criticize these things that that hurt me or that make me uncomfortable. But you have this layer of investment of people who are already here. They love it. So, like, when they when I attack the thing they love, they think I'm attacking them. And it's like, no. And it's you're cheating. That's really the good old thing that I get. This is not and we're not arguing. With you. This is a cheating argument. Because you're like you're telling me, oh, we'll use different words. Well, what words am I supposed to use? <laughs> right. What am I oh, say it nicely? How much more nicely do you want me to say it? I've already kissed everybody's ass telling them I don't call anybody racist, sexist. I never do that. How much ass do you want me to kiss? And it gets me to the point where I can't like I can't even say these words appropriate. And I don't even say like terrible ones. Like there's a lot of worse words that I can use, you know. But I I, I choose like you know to use words that are that have established meanings. Like you said before, like there's a little bit of specificity to them, appropriation and misogyny, and you know these these words that are like have a a, a real some meat to them. We can discuss them. So it's like if I can't even use those words, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. But they don't care because it, to them, it's not about the discussion. It's about, I just want to feel good. I just want to like, you know, I want to feel good in this hobby. I don't want my stuff criticized. It's just, it's a realistic of like, just leave it the way it is. What's the problem? You're causing the problem, Jason. The problem's not there. You're causing it. I'm like, no, there's a problem. And, and then, then it, and on it goes from there. Continuing on this topic of like, you know, trying to analyze how dialogue and social media works particularly i've been i've been toying with this idea for a little while a couple months in my mind off and on that we've become people obsessed with hypocrisy in finding mm-hmm. hypocrisy in others rather yeah. than engaging the arguments themselves mm-hmm and it's something because I, I teach debate. That's like my my main thing, other than than board gaming stuff. Is is I teach debate uh, to nice. mostly high schoolers. And one thing I I've started including in all the classes I teach is explaining that calling out hypocrisy in the context of in, of an argument about policy or action or whatever, uh, mm-hmm. calling out hypocrisy is an ad hominem. Mm-hmm. It's only an attack on the person. Now maybe. If your if your goal is to elicit change in the person, then it, it becomes you know valid. But if the sure. goal is to decide whether or not a particular course of action is good or bad, uh, the hypocrisy part is a fallacy, right? Because it doesn't prove the argument one way or another. It only indicts the the person. And I feel like so much of time and energy and dialogue and words typed out is so focused on finding hypocrisy in others right. that the arguments never get engaged with at all. I can do six ways from Sunday, my friend. I'm so glad you mentioned this. It's a whole can of worms. <laughs> like this idea of like, okay, well, you know, I do a video with a with games in my background and I have um, Eldritch Horror. I love Eldritch Horror. And uh, uh, co- inevitably, I'll be like, well, how could you speak? Uh, you like Eldritch Horror, Edgy Belovecast was a racist. Like you, you endorse a racist. So how am I supposed to see you? You know, whatever, whatever. Or like, you know, uh, why aren't you talking about, um, you know, the games that are printed in China? 
you know, this labor, you know, you're not speaking up against labor. So why are we going to criticize this other thing? Like the, the what about is, um, and it's like, okay, well, you're a hypocrite for saying that. So like, you get, you know, like trying to get me on the hypocrite point, like, you know, you're not speaking about that. So don't speak about this. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because like, I mean, you're not engaging the merits. All you're doing is distracting. Like you're, you're basically that like you're redirecting. You're trying to make me talk about this thing that, that, you're cool with and direct me away from this thing that you're that makes you uncomfortable that's all you're doing i'll talk about hp lovecraft sure i'll talk about all that stuff that's not this video that's not this message it's not this point it, it happens all the time mark <laughs> yeah and now that i've now that i thought about it i see it all over the place all the place now it's, it's really so- annoying <laughs> Right, <laughs> but I've also caught it in myself, right? I've also caught yeah, sure. myself of 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 immediately my own mind, like, oh, my rebuttal, you know, I, this thing is outrageous, and the rebuttal in my mind is is to, is to be f- find or or point out the ways in which the speaker is being hypocritical, and, and yeah, it's it it gets in you, mm-hmm. like it, it, that's that's so such a corruption of 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 actually being able to engage in arguments on their own merit it's really hard not to fall into that trap and and to actually engage with the argument well at the same time recognizing mm -hmm. that being hypocritical about something personally is is, you know something you should probably resolve (laughs) well i mean okay so getting back to the colonialist thing and like they like honestly and i i know i'm biased i i know i'm biased i'm just gonna preface this i really believe that when you really look at these euro colonialist games there is no intellectual justification for that. None. You can justify war games. Like to getting back to the point, like, can you make history and games? Like, I'm not talking about war games, I'm not talking about all these, that's a, a separate. Even like, you know, I I'm like disgusted by like a Jap the Ripper type thing. Like a, I don't like that, but like I, I affirm your right to play it. We live in a free society, we have first amendment protections. Like you, you do your thing. Just don't make me do it. <laughs> you know? Respect the fact that I have a response and like just keep it private to you. Or like a secret Hitler. It's like, oh. Ugh. So like there's all these games that are like difficult. So like, and I'm, you know, I, I choose, you know, and, and whatever. The Euro argument, the Euro games that have this history stuff and the ones that do colonialism, the ones that that the ones that are meant for a mass audience, the ones that put you in a place of a colonizer, and the ones that lie. That's all of a piece for me. Right? There's no intellectual justification for them it is all feelings it is all comfort it is all what we've gotten used to we've we've had fun with these we've had fun with these for 20 years and i'll get this thing it's like okay well we've been playing with this for 20 years what it's a problem now no it's a problem the entire time dude usually dude it's a problem the entire and we're finally finally to the point where are we're not getting yelled at and like beaten away from the game store like, I remember I made this comment about Puerto Rico in 2005 when I first saw it and, like, laughed out of the complete strategist in New York City. Laughed, you know, and, like, get out of here, whatever, whatever. And, like, that's not cancel culture? It, it, it's only cancel culture if a progressive person does it or a marginalized person does it? No, I, I, you know, that, was, that critique was getting canceled the entire time. And, yeah, I didn't press the point. You know, because I didn't really get like what was terrible. I just I just had this like vague sense of discomfort, and now it's like I I I can't. I mean, I I have to like, have a consistent voice, and it's like okay, now we're getting to the intellectual defense of it. It's like, can you intellectually defend Puerto Rico the way it is? How do you defend something that has to lie in order to fulfill its function, in order to be it, in order to be its achieve its apotheosis, which is a gain for the mass market that immerses you in history uncritically you can't so like you have to so the more i get into these arguments the more it's like they have to distract they have to add hominem they have to it's just a game it, there's no justification for it except force and power and in whatever you call like, like inertia let me ask you from a designer standpoint right so say you're sure. a designer right you're interested in making a euro game you want you know, your game in the broadest sense of like the game is about building instead of destroying. Right. And you don't want to make a Gricola. You don't want to make like a personal farming game. And you want to have a map because you think maps are really cool. 
like geography and like yeah. expanding across geography. Like, is sure. there a game you can make? There's plenty of games. There's plenty of games you can make. Like, what's the, what's it, the solution from the designer's perspective there? There's plenty of games you make. I mean, so like, that's why I, I isolate like, okay, being in the perspective of the boss fantasy, right? I mean, the, like when you're a boss uh, and you're a boss of a certain level, right? You're going to encounter mo- tough choices. You're going to exploit people. You can't be powerful unless you exploit somebody somewhere along the way. And so like, you know, these games that kind of celebrate that. It's like, I think, and even another game, like Hadrian's Wall, the Rolling Right Can you play Hadrian's Wall? Or heard of it? No. Okay, it's a fantastic game, but like, you know, you're a boss, you're your builder, right? You're building Hadrian's Wall. I'm like, okay, they, the, in the Roman times, you had slaves, but the game calls them servants. It just keeps going and going and going. And so you can do these historical games. Well, first of all, you can't lie, right? Which, which that's a, to me, that's an ironclad. And like, does that, will that limit your audience? I got no problem with that. Like, I, I, I don't, res- I don't, you know, like you're, you have your artistic vision and like, you know, there's going to be things that, 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 are, that an artist is going to make with their game that's going to limit their sales. Like, you know, Vital Asserta could make, you know, games for the masses. He chooses not to. He chooses to make these big boutique games that realize his vision. So like there's creators all the time make decisions to limit their audience. So make your game that will limit your audience by being, by being truthful. That's number one, right? If you're going to make Puerto Rico in that time period, there's other ways to solve that. But let's say you would, you, you're, you're like really devoted to the new world or whatever it is, or the age of discovery, which a lot of games are in the age of discovery. Like, you know, Jamaica is a game like, you know, they're in the age of pirates. Be, there's so many pirate games and like that whole motif. And it was a wash and slaves. And, you, know, you have to erase all that stuff to, to, to approach that time period. So like you can, self-select and be honest and like limit your audience that way that is a choice the way you do it counts and whatever it is but whatever so uh, actually a game like lisboa going back to the search thing lisboa i think is a beautiful game you know like it, it drills down in a time period so it, it's a little bit more kind of isolated it doesn't like call it doesn't lie about things mm-hmm. right and so like you can that's you could totally do that i love that i that, that's one of the games like i i I don't love it because I don't love heavy euros, but like just the whole construction of it, mm-hmm. you know, that, that the rebuilding from an earthquake and all that kind of stuff. Like, I love that. And, you know, they, and they, you know, they use like, you know, they, they, they you know, workers, and they, 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 um, they don't lie about how much of a bastard the guy who rebuilt, I forget what his name was like some uh, Duke or something like that. Yeah. There's like a whole, yeah. There's a whole a thing behind it. Right. There's like the churches involved and the local yeah. governor and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and I and like you know, it's it's not in the game. Like you know, you don't have to like know that stuff. But like, it's not. It doesn't put a, a shroud over it and like say, "Don't look at this." It's just saying, "Okay, we're going to focus on the building part." But and, and, and the game, and even in the rulebook, it invites you to kind of learn more. And like the more you learn, it's like, "Wow, this is like really interesting." It's like one piece of it, but I'm invited, not just shut off from um, truth. Uh, so like, you can go the hyper local route like that. You can, and this is this is this is also kind of a half baked thought. Um, but I'm still developing it like train games that gets brought up a lot, right. As, as a hypocrite thing, it's like, you like train games. There's a lot of like Chinese workers that were oppressed. And there's a lot of other people that were oppressed. How could you play this train game? How could you, you know, criticize this one game and not criticize a train game? And I'm like, okay, first of all, I'll make that video later. So watch my video, please. <laughs> Second of all, I, there's something about like like Lisboa, which is a city or a train. There was there was oppression in order to build the thing, but the thing belongs to the people. Everyone can take a train. It, it, poor, rich, or whatever it is, everyone has taken a train. So, or like the Panama Canal, right? You know, it's it's you know, like anything like you know, corrupt government and exploited workers and like all this stuff so like but but you know what have you what is there now what is there now is a a, a thing that every every panamanian knows and every panamanian has interacted with in some way and how cool would it be to play a game that at least represents that history and like you know and doesn't like tell obvious lies. Like, okay, colonists built this, you know. And so, like, to, to me, like, I'm willing to give those types of games a lot more leeway because at least I'm telling the story of something that actual real people enjoy. Mm-hmm. 
that's much different. That's so much more different than, you know, like uh, some fantasy plantation wealth. And no one gives a crap about plantations in Puerto Rico. That's just there for wealth. But like if you're building a railroad, if you're building you know, a wonder, you know, like at least the end result is something that belongs to people and belongs to the world. And, and having a game that tells that story, not that that's, you know, like good. It's not like pure, but I'm willing to ride with it a little bit better, you know, as opposed to, you know, these games that where I'm, where I'm just making a, a, a farm or a plantation or whatever it is. I got that, that. There's no, there's no, nothing of value emerges from the latter. What do you think of games that are, clearly like about colonization but it's like straight sci-fi like you know the colonization games in outer space and that kind of stuff well, like small world so people bring up small world all the time oh yeah small world yeah small a majority like it's not necessarily like it, it's like you're, you're building your territory and you're building up your people and you know like you can see like it's it it maps onto you know um people's gathering lands and you know, border conflicts and all that kind of stuff and like you can achieve like you know ultimate victory by wiping people off the map if you play pretty well enough in that game so like you know that, that game gets brought up a lot hmm. right or even a game like Catan because like you know like when has you know the building of roads just kind of placidly happened when nobody was there <laughs> like, like Terra Nullis is a fiction so like so yeah, like, yeah. like there's you so many games that kind of like ways back in history before you get to a point where like yeah, right. Explore a new <laughs> land and no one's there. Literally. <laughs> to go a long ways back. <laughs> Maybe like Greenland or something. Right, like right, of right. The upper reaches or even then. Uh, so like, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of games that kind of like touch upon it. Like for and everyone's gonna have a different um border with this. My own border is I'm I'm cooler with that than I am with like taking actual historical place names i i i am i am a person that i i believe in history i think that we are poor for not having proper historical memory you know the reason i i, I so have such a problem with he, secret hitler so much is because it tells terrible history and it, it trivializes first of all it trivializes history and it presents hitler in a way that's like you know he was always a brutal b-word always but the game makes it seem like oh he was kind of hiding and slick and you know, it's like oh and then uh, this at some point it's like ha ha i fooled you all and i'm like no that's this it, it's so trivializing of what actually happened and when we forget you know th those who forget history are doomed to repeat it mm -hmm. you know uh and so like we forget this we forget these historical things and so like we just get ourselves in these pits and so i have a much more critical eye when game designers appropriate actual historical places so i'm thinking about different so i'm not thinking about morally necessarily because like is this good is this bad is this good is this bad i'm thinking about like just you know culturally what it does to have a colonialist game that appropriates history and robs us not robs us but like you know if someone is going to know history there's a really good chance that uh, for these there were countries, marginalized places. This is the only exposure they're going to have. A lot of people that, that Puerto, Puerto, the Puerto Rico game is the only exposure they have to actual Puerto Rico. That's what you get. See, culturally, I think that that does some that that's a it's an ecosystem bad thing as opposed to like, is this good? Is this bad? Is this good? Is this bad? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about this earlier today. About I don't remember what it, what the topic was, but like my you know my inclination is to try to like figure out the line right figure out the hard line of okay what is acceptable what is not but what you just said i think is is perhaps the more worthy but also the harder task and that is you look at the history of board games of the last 20 years and you and you it's pretty easy to say to to, to recognize that by and large you know mostly disconnected peoples uh, have all decided to treat colonialism really poorly in their theming in their board game theming that's because it's any you know the reason for that i think is pretty evident it's just you know exploring and building is really fun yeah, to do really fun and you look in in somewhat recent history look we had a whole we had a few centuries where a bunch of large superpowers explored and and conquered and built uh and it's it's actually it's there's it's more than that though i mean it's cool it's also nostalgic like no one builds anymore 
we don't build Americans don't build anything anymore because it's all built or it's all like appropriated and behind gates and behind like property and whatever it is. And there's a nostalgia to these games that like, Oh, you know, we could start again. And and it's also easier, right? Like, like the idea of like, you know, what, what could, what could a country build in the 20, like in 2020 that would have the amount of like, social effort and cost and exertion of like right. the Egyptians building the pyramid. No, it's too easy to build things now. Like, you, right. like that's like living on Mars. Like that's our pyramid. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we will not get to a building point again until we live on Mars. Yes. Yeah. Or um, until like climate change wipes half the planet away. We have to geoengineer and rebuild or whatever. Yeah, but like we don't live, stuff. like we don't live in a building era anymore so like these building games tickle a nostalgia yeah that yeah. i think is powerful for people i really do yeah um so anyways all that to say it's easy to see sure, sure. why this becomes an attractive theme um right and i'm cool with that just yeah. watch it when you borrow from the history yeah um, like watch it when you borrow from history sorry just do it yeah and there's so many other ways like you, uh, you mentioned before like how 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 do you tell stories like that how do you tell stories that build without like putting people in that boss frame. Well, I mean, you could tell a story from a more, you could tell more local stories, like the rebuilding of, you know, cities. You could tell stories from the perspective of more of the perspective of workers. You know, you can, you know, even something like, and I know we talked about this on our Twitter, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm getting bigger into like, okay, pay your workers, pay them, but they don't work for you. At the very least do that. The very least do that. There's so many games that like, they don't, you don't pay your workers because it's too complicated or like it adds complications. It's like, no, no, no. The constitutive element of a worker is not that they generate labor, is that you pay them for their labor. That's a constitutive element. There's not, you, you take out either one of those things, pay or value extracted, you don't have a worker anymore. So pay them. Yeah. Or they go away. Or you just but, call them like, effort right you abstract it outside of people you have to really yeah, you have to like not call more or like you know construct, reconstruct your thing right? they're not workers they're uh, time like time investment or something yeah sure yeah yeah you have um, to really abstract it's like but like you know we gamers like to have workers like we like for whatever reason you always see that in in forums like what's the best worker placement game and to give me your top 10 worker placement games like because we love workers and but well, we don't love to a lot of pay those worker <laughs> placement games aren't like you look at it they're not talking about workers at all it's just the name of the genre and it's really Right. like effort right it's their time anyways missions and all that kind of stuff anyway, yeah let me get back to what i was saying sorry uh, <laughs> tangents so, no no because i think you i think you said something really really cool earlier and i want to highlight it so my inclination is to try to figure out okay what's right what's wrong we can solve it uh, but the, i don't mm, i don't yeah, think yeah. that works right i don't think that actually works and we look back at the history of board games we see colonialism done so poorly and we and we were like what's up here like the, something clearly went wrong but mm-hmm. There's not like one person to blame. Like there's a whole bunch of people acting semi-independently and it just became a trend. Mm -hmm. So what's the solution to that? I don't think the solution, I mean, in some ways we can lay down some hard lines. Like this is clearly offensive. Like these things are clearly offensive, but I think there's a lot that can be done in kind of the soft dialogue of re-examining our collective priorities re-examining the kinds of the kinds of things we want to communicate with games and and examining what games can do that's new and interesting and fascinating and i want to tie into why uh if you haven't seen it those listening uh the zenobia awards Mm -hmm. are super cool if you didn't see the announcement of the finalists there those games look so cool Mm-hmm. And there's one about like competing theories about Machu Picchu. Like that's insane. A board game is dealing with like, like the subject of history of historical interpretation. Uh, there's one by um, what's his name? Damon, Damon or Damien Stone. I forget who was the lead uh, designer on Netrunner when I was back when I was playing Netrunner competitively uh, doing about the Haitian revolution, the, the mm. slave rebellion. Which, why hasn't that been a game before? I can tell you exactly why, but I'm not, I'll I'll spare. It's an incredible (laughs) war game, like, setting. And so, these kinds of soft dialogues in terms of, like, 
what you're doing, examining our priorities and talking through these ideas and also Mm -hmm. in designers designing games that take new and novel approaches and examine things from, from interesting perspectives. I think that does the work of reversing the kind of cultural trends more than trying to figure out the hard line of which, right. which colonial games are acceptable and which ones are not. Like and there's so many people that kind of like, they, they go the line, right? They're looking for the line. It's like, when is it bad? When is it good? Was it bad? Was it good? Like, and they, and so a good way to think about it is like, Intent versus impact, right? When we, the, the two completely different paradigms, and they're not like mutually exclusive, but they're very, very different. Uh, so you're talking about when you talk about intent, that's where like the moral comes in. Like, a, you know, do I intend to do harm? Do I intend to do offend? Do I tend, you know, and feelings and all kind of stuff. Like, am I, you know, what what do I feel? What do you feel? So like, you, you can go into that whole world. And I like, I think you mentioned it before. It's just like you get yourself, you know, twisted in knots you know, finding these lines because everybody has different lines, whatever it is. And I'm checked out of that whole structure. And all I want to talk about is impact. Like what is the, what is the impact of your game on different people? What is the impact of your game relative to like, okay. Assuming that no one will get message about the time period other than the game, which is not a, uh, uh, erroneous assumption. Even the land of Google, even the land of phones, even like what what will make people curious about a land if they get a product that presents it so flat and with with lies basically in it. Like you're, you're basically it closes off curiosity. It doesn't actually inspire curiosity. So like in terms of a you know in terms of a game, like what's acceptable, what's not. I don't go there. Like does your game inspire curiosity? Does your game make me want to learn more about a land or does your game like a vacuum sealed package that's just meant to make me feel good and doesn't inspire any curiosity at all? And I'm cool with that. I'm cool with like little self-contained fun things. I just don't think that's history. History shouldn't be that way. History you should learn. It should be part of our cultural patrimony. We should have as much historical consciousness as possible and save the fun, happy fun times for like circling the moon. Center of the earth, whatever you want. There's so many good themes out there. Leave history to the, the leave histories and cultures to the curious. So, like, if you're building your game, it's not like, will I offend this or will I not? It's, will this make people curious? Will this make, will this contribute to learning? Will this contribute to, you know, a, a cultural knowledge and also be a fun game? Or am I appropriating history because people are familiar with names and I'm just trying to make a buck? Mm-hmm. and get attention yeah that's my line I'll, I'll add a little bit to that just to bring in again my curiosities and moral philosophy in in that the school i went to is really was really fo- the philosophy department was really focused on on, on virtue ethics uh, as one of the major branches of moral philosophy Love um, it. which is it's often very difficult to define and I, I still have a hard hard time kind of really grasping what it's about because it's it's very it's very loose but the the easiest way I've, I've learned to describe it to my students when I talk about it uh, which I'm getting a lot of practice uh, this year because the debate topic has lots of uh, value uh, nice. moral stuff going on it's about the prison system um, <laughs> so, oh yeah so I'm Get lots, lots all, about, all about different theories of punishment uh, let them play prison architect there you go <laughs> <laughs> um And like the difference is that in most different conceptions of, of ethics, right. You'd say it is wrong to lie or you shouldn't lie because, and then give, you know, various reasons in virtue ethics, the framing is different and it's more along the lines of you shouldn't be the kind of person who lies. Yeah. And so when we're talking about, if you, pull that out to kind of a culture or subculture. You know, game is very much a subculture uh, or board gaming is like a sub, 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 subculture. Yeah, absolutely. And then historical war gaming is a, you know, sub, sub, sub culture. Uh, when we're talking about cultural things. This, the kind of soft dialogue, right. The, or responding by creating your own game or, or really digging into the history. What I'm d- describing is soft dialogue, not like the hard line, 
this is right, this is wrong, I think lends itself to that framing a bit better yeah. of let's not try to like create villains and heroes among our culture, among within our group, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ex- excluding extreme circumstances. But how can we cultivate the kind of community where we want to build really truthful, fascinating, curious games? And that's that's a bit trickier, but I, th- I think much, much more rewarding. I was a um, ethics person in my theology program. I taught virtue ethics. I taught all, all sorts of ethics, but okay, cool. virtue yeah. ethics was my. You probably know kind much more than I do, anyways. Orientation. <laughs> no, it's been a long time. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I definitely want to get away from like the rules based, like here's a menu of stuff and let me like pick off the menu from stuff, from like, you know, and this is what's going to guide my behavior to a reflection on character, a reflection of, okay, how many, like, like moral formation, really. Like, you know, we're not just like talking about moral rules, talk about the moral formation of the person. I'm a, I'm a humanist at the end of the day, mm-hmm. a huge humanist. And, and the virtue ethic folds into that in the sense of, you know, what is, what does it mean to be like a good person? And what does it mean? Like, you know, what kind of person do I want to be? What kind of actions do I do? What kind of character do I want? And it's like, I can have the character of, of a capitalist who just wants to make a buck. And that's like that, like like that's morally kind of neutral, just kind of off it, you know, just from the, the get go, and, and that can go a good way. It's like a, you know, I, I because that's an also a counter argument. It's like okay, well, we get these games. I would never have heard of anything without these games, right? You know, like I, now I know about Marrakesh. Now I know about the world. Like I've learned about the like I learned about uh, geography from Ticket to Ride. Like if I play all the maps of Ticket to Ride, I'm going to get a decent geographical education, right? And great. Then there's these games that promote simplified, objectified lies, and I and that is as a person and a, as a, as someone who cares about like the the formation of other people's ideas about these cultures, or like you know an Egypt game. Name an Egypt game without a pyramid. Name an Egypt game or like without a camel. <laughs> we don't know anything because that's that's the stereotype. So it's like okay, you know that's not wrong, but it's so reductive. And we're encouraging this 2D, like this happiness with a 2D approach to culture. And if we want to be a multicultural society, the value, the virtue that we cultivate is curiosity about other people. We don't just like rely on these, these photocopies. That, that's what like what we've gotten in terms of games. And like, you know, the Zenobias are a great thing. I, um, I, do, I did a playthrough for one of the Zenobia. I don't know if there was a finalist, but it was one of the entries uh, for a game called Tendaya, which is about the Canary Islands and about natives surviving the Canary Islands during the period of conquistadors. It's an amazing game. It makes me curious about like, okay, what gods did they worship and what did the conquistadors do? And all this stuff, like it actually inspired me to kind of look up more. Cause it was such a cool, and it was a cool game. It was like a Spirit Island S type thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I love Spirit Island. Spirit Island like a top five game for me. Oh yeah, that's, um, yeah, same here. I played it the yeah. other day. I finished, <laughs> it was one of those situations where I finished and I was just like, oh, it's so ah, that's so good. <laughs> it's it's like when, so good. Like after you eat a really great meal, like that, that like uh, contentment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what Spirit Island, and you know, people like it's, it's a great you know, people are Spirit Island all the time. It's like, okay, here's a good way to do a colonization game. Like, yeah, pl- you could do that, you know. Uh, and I would encourage more. And the Tendai is another one of those that hopefully it does well on its game front because it's it kind of it's going to game front next year. And so, like, yeah, that's that's that is a that is way a way to do it. But I think that you can still do like you know the builders and the the how do you build stuff and how do you like explore land. You just need to be more honest. Mm-hmm. And if you're gonna you're gonna take an you're gonna take a, an audience hit, you're gonna take a mass market hit. But the, if you if you're careful, you work with consultants. That would also help. Like you know, if you're gonna work from the land, talk to people from the land or people who are familiar with the land. That's nice. The gaming is. Be, I know we're a sub sub subculture, but like gaming has at least grown enough to like you can find somebody if you look from basically everywhere. You know, like I mean, uh, on my show, I had a you know a guy from Nigeria had a whole of uh, AB con Africa con. Pan Africa, you, 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 gamers right there, plenty of them, and on from everywhere. 
they're there. So like, you know, work with the consultants and, you know, have the right spirit, inspire curiosity with your game. And, you know, there's a lot of ways, a lot of positive ways that you can do it. I, I don't, this defeatism of like, okay, well, if we, if we don't do colonialist games, we'll never, we'll get less games. No, it's about more games, not less. Sometimes you have to like kind of clear out the weed in order to let more flowers grow. Yeah. You, the, the general you, the person, the hypothetical person speaking, like doesn't even know the games that they're not getting. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. Like, I didn't know there were different competing theories about Machu Picchu and what it was for. <laughs> Now, and we would never have gotten it like, without the Zenobias. Never have gotten it. Never, them. never would have known. Like you don't know what you're missing out on. So yeah, I, I'm I'm so excited to see where games go that are curious and from a wide variety of people who have this knowledge that I don't have and this background that I don't have uh, that they can express through games. It, it's it's so exciting. I can't and wait. that's ultimately like you know you, we opened with like okay why is this why is Puerto Rico bad like I think we can kind of you know, start to come to like a summary moment, like and I, that all that stands. I think the real pay forward, like looking forward is these colonialist games because of the way they're structured, because of the, the 2D representation, because they don't inspire curiosity about other cultures. They're very appropriate. They're all made by white Europeans. Now there's anything wrong with white Europeans. I love my white Europeans. It's just that there's a mindset there, right? Uh, there's a mindset of, okay, it's, we're going to make these games that are about the intellectual challenge and like, we're just going to appropriate history for attention and sales. Right. Okay. So it's like, okay, continue making your intellectual challenge games, but you know, you feel free to like either invent a setting or put it in the sun or whatever it is, keep history open so that, you know, you take out that weed. I, I consider it a weed of like these appropriative games and you don't know what's going to flower. I, 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 have a, I have a lot of confidence that if you, you know, take a game like Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, people deny this. It actively pushes people away. I've, I've seen more and more people like, okay, I have Puerto Rico in my collection, but I'll never take it out. Or they threw it away because, ugh, you know, like how do you, why do you want games in the center of your hobby that actually like turn people away? because of its lies <laughs> it's like it, it's not like it's just it's telling an honest story it's just like it's lying so then you know take you know to kind of like reshape those games you know, take those games kind of put them to the side put them in their niches or whatever if you if you continue to join them, go ahead go, go ahead and join puerto rico just does not need to be number one at bg for like 10 years or whatever it was and you you clear those games out and like nature abhors a vacuum like other games will come in we and that's the thing we will get more games because we'll have more people who are vibing with the new things that are being made and everybody wins and even like you know so like the the, the designs like the knizias and whatever it is there i'll work with you there's plenty of cultural people that'll work with you to make something make new exciting things mm. you know it's not like we're like just I hate when the conversation is like, okay, well, don't take out the pitchforks and the torches and everything. You expect me to argue with you when it's like, you're telling me like, oh, don't take out the pitchforks. Do you see a pitchfork? You would know. (laughs) You would know if I am doing the pitchfork and torch thing. I would not be this nice. I would not be this positive, but I am. And so take advantage of that. And people, me and people like me, there's more and more of us from all over the world are willing to partner with these amazing game designers to make awesome stuff. Mm-hmm. And I really hope that we're on the cusp of that. I really do. I, I think we are. From an outside, I don't know. I, I haven't engaged too much in this particular dialogue in, until this episode. But, like, I've been rooting for it, right? And 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 I think we're seeing it. Like, I, I think we're seeing it with, you know, new people coming in, but also more excitement for the weird especially like the historical games the weird quirky games that take super niche topics like there just seems to be more people even the ones that already existed like there's more people interested i think in those games now you know which pushes you know more of them obviously because demand is uh increased for them so it seems like in our little community there's we are at a tipping point or we just passed it like like we're about we're about to reap uh so to speak and I am thrilled for it. Any final thoughts, comments, uh, things you didn't say before but want to say now? <laughs> this was by far my favorite guest spot of any podcast. Whoa. This was amazing. Really? 
I've done a bunch of guests, but we got deep, man. We got, I love this stuff. I love talking oh, philosophy man. and history and morals and like on, on a high level. Like this is this is great, man. I really appreciate it. I, being on I appreciate that, man. That makes my day. I wasn't having a great day, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you ask you ask beautiful questions. I can tell you're curious about this stuff. I can tell you come at this with a spirit of. You know, uh, like you said before, you're curious. Like you're not exposed to a lot. Of, you came with a lot of curiosity about it, and you asked the right questions. And and you know, it, it, after it, we we hit a, like a zone, I love that. And time just disappears, and I can just talk about this stuff for hours and hours. Yeah. And yeah. so I thank you so much. It's, I just want to like I, I don't have any like I, I my channel is Shelf Stories, youtubecom shelf stories. Go ahead and subscribe. Like I don't have a Patreon and all that stuff. It's just like I just, I just do it for a lark. I do this for fun. I do this to exercise my mind. And so it's like, you know, anybody that follows, I'm like, yo, well, thank you. That's like a bonus to me. That's like promo. But like, I just, I really appreciate you, Mark. That was really, I just really had a lot of fun. Oh, I, I did as well. And, and thank you so much. It, it helped me, I mean, even clarify uh, the thoughts I had because I was running through like the, the stuff I'd seen, the, the dialogue I'd seen on, on social media and Twitter and all that. And yeah, this helped, this helped clarify a few things in my mind of, not necessarily like what I believe about it, because I think we're pretty much in agreement on, sure. on the broad strokes, but more the strategic, right? The, mm-hmm. How do we, like strategically, how do we improve this community, this cult subculture? Uh, how do you explain it? How do you yeah, like yeah. defend it? Is it like you, because uh, you don't want to, you, and this is the mistake a lot of us make, and this is one of the, the topics that I wanted this is the, one of the main things about show stories. Like I, I call it good trouble. It's not just trouble. It's good trouble. And I think um, my mission is to help folks on my side who are speaking for marginalized people. We need to be able to argue this stuff in a, a elevated way. You know, we can't just say, well, this is racist. And you got to get rid of it because, of, you know, and because you get that reaction of like, okay, you can't use those words because you're going to trigger feelings and you're going to you know, inflame war and like we have to own that like we have to own that you know our words can trigger these feelings even if it's true <laughs> or even if like the things i'm not talking about the people but the things are even that's the truth like there's so many other like ways that we can explain ourselves there's so many ways that we can like say okay we are going for the improvement of humanity we are going for a multicultural vision and let's, so let's like really drill down and articulate it. Like there's like, this is all good. Like the, you know, everyone wins. This is a win-win here. And the way we talk, sometimes we talk about like, we talk and we give the sense that like, we're trying to take from stuff. You took it. We're going to take it back. Uh, maybe a little bit of that, but like for the most part, like there's enough stuff, <laughs> enough games and gaming going around that we can all win. Yeah. So we just need to, it, it's a, the harder road. I, I think you said, you said that earlier in the pod, it's the harder road, but it's, worth it do the harder things so that you can get the the bigger reward let's do let's do it i'm, I'm ready i'm pumped 11 20 at night so i'm really you know i'm pumped <laughs> <laughs> well i think that's uh that's a good place as any to wrap up thanks for listening everybody uh again you can uh see what jason's doing at shelf stories on youtube i highly recommend it i watched a couple of them earlier today and and I should subscribe. Actually, I haven't yet. I'm sorry. Hit that subscribe <laughs> button. Go for it. What they say? Cost you nothing. It. You have to smash it, right? That's, just caught hit a couple. Like, just do it a couple times. People just doing a couple times. Okay. Well, subscribe it, early. Subscribe often. <laughs> <laughs> At least you have to click it an odd number of times, or else you just back out, right? If you click it twice, you've subscribed, That's and then. True. <laughs> That's true. Multiple. You, you click it multiple times as long as it's an odd number. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway shelf stories uh, uh for the what i do you can go to the thoughtful gamer.com if you would like to support this podcast go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer we're also both on on twitter i'm also on facebook and instagram uh where can they find you on twitter jason shelf stories gbl games books life awesome and oh there's always one i forget oh right yeah, if you want to help algorithm stuff, go ahead and rate mm. the podcast. I hear that helps. I only hear that from other podcasts, so maybe someone started that and now <laughs> all the podcasts are repeating it. Maybe it does help. Yeah, deal. it does help. It does? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, there we go. Confirmed. It does help. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Later, everybody.